Hello everyone and welcome to this video from BlenderCookie.com. My name is Jonathan Williamson and today I'm going to give you an overview of many of the new prominent features in Blender 2.62. 2.62 came out uh, just last week and it's a pretty exciting release as most of them are. We've got a lot of new tools to use. Um, we've got new UV tools, extra additions to cycles, new modifiers, new game engine tools. A lot of different things, and so I'm going to try and give you an overview of a lot of the most prominent ones, and then just kind of give you a quick run through down the list and help explain what some of the other ones are. So, starting right off the bat, uh, let me just jump over to the release notes. If you haven't already seen them, I highly encourage you to read through the Blender 2.62 release notes, and frankly, for, for all versions, anytime a new version comes out, checking the release notes is a good way to kind of see what's been, uh, what's been added, what's been changed, etc. So here on the rele release notes, which you can get to simply by going to the Blender.org homepage, and then click uh, either Blender 2.62 released, or click Download Blender. From Download Blender, you can then see a release notes link here, just click that. And then we have a complete list of everything in 2.62. If we just go down this list, we can see that we've got additions to cycles, we've got additions to motion tracking, UV tools, carve booleans, remesh modifier, game engine, Collada, Python API, more features, add-ons, and then numerous bug fixes. So I'm going to just start. Um, I've, I've got a separate list that I'm kind of following, so I'm not going to do it in this order specifically. But I'm going to start with the UV tools. There's a lot of really cool new UV tools that came from the latest Google Summer of Code, uh, namely uh, an improved stitch tool, which I'm going to show you here in just a moment, and then uh, you know ver various other ones, the other main one being UV sculpting. So let's just jump right over to Blender and check out what these are. So I'm going to open up the female base mesh model that I released on BlendSwap the other day that you can get, and let's just take a look at first the uh, the UV stitching. So stitching, if you're not aware of it, is basically where we um, take two mesh pieces or two UV pieces that are connected on the actual mesh, let's say such as the, the head and the body, and we stitch their, their corresponding vertices together, where this edge loop right here actually connects to the base of the neck right here. And the way that this used to have to be done in Blender was you would have to do this manually if you wanted to do it at all. Well, now we have a new tool. You can find it from going to UVs and you can find Stitch. The hotkey is just V. So if you just say select this island now by pressing L with your mouse over it and hit V, you'll automatically go into a new mode called Stitch. And you can see a preview of this. For one, it's very nice because you can still move around. You can view your model, uh, you know, do whatever you want to do. And you can see a preview of how it's being stitched. So the red indicates vertices that cannot be stitched or that are not being stitched. And then the green indicate the ones that are being stitched. And you can see where it's automatically been repositioned and automatically detected which vertices each one corresponds to. And you can see that there's a few problem areas in here, such as these ones like this. So if we just hold down shift and right click, we can deselect any of those problem vertices that we don't want. And you can see that since this one and this one are actually the same vertex in 3D space, it's deselected both of them. But then we could go in, deselect any of these others that we don't want, or select them, and it would automatically add those back. Um, we can go ahead, you can see we've got some limits down here, so if we press S, we have snap, so this way it won't re change the island position, just leave the island in place. If we hit, turn it back on, you can see the island moves. We've got midpoints are off at the moment, if we hit M, we can turn them on, and that's just going to move both islands uh, together to fit, rather than moving one island, you know, rather than moving this island to here, or this island here, it moves them both to the center. Next, we also have the limit option, uh, which the limit option works for midpoints. And if we just hold down the Alt key and scroll up on our mouse, we can adjust that limit. And basically, you can see what's happening as as I scroll up, it increases the limit. And then anything within that limit or within that threshold will then be stitched and moved together. So little option that you can use there. Uh, next, we have... Down here, we have the switch island. If we just hit I, it'll switch which island it's going to snap to. So if we want to snap to this one or this one, we can do that. Uh, and then the last one is shift select vertices, which I already did. So if I were to now left click or press the enter key, just like this, it's automatically stitched those together. And now those UVs are merged together. 
Now, having done that, though, you know, we may see that we have some pretty nasty stretching right in here. In fact, we can go in and look at this, and we can see that, well, actually, frankly, it looks pretty good. Um, there's some nasty stretching right in there. So now be, might be when we would use the new UV Sculpt tools. So the UV Sculpt tools are really cool. You can access them by pressing N to bring up the toolbar over here. And, uh, well, actually, first, before we can access them, we need to enable them. So if we go to the UVs menu, we have UV Sculpt is a new entry. We just click that. And now, right down here, you can see that we have a new section called UV Sculpt. We have a, the normal radius and grab, just like we're used to in other parts of Blender, um, where F will change the size of your brush. Shift F will change the, the strength. Uh, and then the hotkeys access the individual sculpt tool. So we have a grab, relax, or pinch, where grab is exactly what it sounds like. You just move vertices around. The, the pinch will suck vertices in towards the center, or if you hold down control, it will push them out. And then the, the relax is perhaps the most useful, and that is the smooth key. And you can then just smooth out or relax vertices. So here in these areas where it's maybe a little tough, it'll actually go in and try and relax those and kind of smooth them out to give us a nicer result right in here. Now, you, you know, you can do this anywhere you want. So if you go in and relax these, it'll just smooth those out. So this is a really helpful tool for kind of smoothing your UVs, making sure you don't have any weird, uh, nasty intersecting areas. Of course, you can adjust the strength to make it, you know, more, more effective or not. Uh, you have several different relax methods here, HC or lipilation. Uh, I personally cannot speak for what these actually do, but if you just do a quick Google search, I'm sure that you could find out what those actually mean. And there you go. So that's basically UV Sculpt. It's very, very simple. Uh, works really well. Oh, and with the Sculpt or with the smoothing, uh, you can access it at any point. So if you have the grab brush up and then you just hold down shift, it will automatically activate the smooth or the relax tool just like it does uh, in sculpting for activating the smooth tool. One other thing, or two other things, we have lock borders and sculpt all UV islands. Lock borders uh, just means that it keeps the, the border exactly intact. So you notice they don't move at all. If I turn this off, the borders can move. Uh, sculpt on sculpt all islands means right now it's going to affect all islands. So if I you know relax these, they all get relaxed. If I turn off sculpt islands, it will only sculpt on the one that I first click on underneath my mouse. So now I can, you know, go in, move this all around I want, and it's never going to affect the other one unless I click on it first. So very handy, good way to kind of uh, mitigate where your, your sculpting is taking place and works really, really well. So this is a really, really nice little tool for UV sculpting, mainly for cleaning up. Personally, my favorite is the UV uh, Relax. Just makes it really easy to smooth out some of those more problematic areas. And then, of course, the stitching is just incredibly cool. Next, uh, we've got a couple more features available in uh, the UV tools that are new. One is the, uh, the scenes from UV Islands. So let's imagine that this is an imported model that I imported via an OBJ or something like that, where it has UV coordinates, but none of the seams for those UV coordinates are set up. So for example, I might go ahead and clear all the seams on this model. My UV coordinates are still intact, but I don't have any seams on here. So, you know, this can be rather obnoxious because if you ever want to adjust the UVs on the automatic import, you're going to have to go in and manually assign all of those seams or simply start over from scratch. Well, now we have um, a new tool under the UVs. We can say seams from islands, and that will automatically detect all the islands and add in the seams here. And in this case, that works great. You'll notice that it did not add a seam around the neck, except they're at the base, because I stitched those together, so there's no longer a seam there. It's added it around the arms, around the legs, and all the other seams that I previously had in there. The other seam tool is the ability to tag seams directly from the UV editing view. You can find it if you see um, mark seams is now control E. So for example, if I were to go in and just select, say, we'll just grab, say, these three edges and hit control E, it will mark a seam on those edges. So if we zoom here to the back, you can see it's marked a seam there. If I hit, um, I don't know if there's actually a way to clear a seam from the, the 3D view, but if I go here, control E, clear seam, then I can go ahead and clear it all that I want, or I can go back in, mark the seam from the islands again. So 
that's pretty much it. Um, very, very helpful at times. Most of you probably will not be using it, but the times that you do need it, it's very, very crucial. Uh, next is Subsurf Aware Unwrapping. So some of you may be aware that when, when we work with a Subsurf modifier, the UVs do not represent the subsurfed model. They represent the original cage mesh that you see right here. And so you can see that the mesh actually changes the littlest bit between those. So per perfect way to see this is if I go ahead and click this button here, you can see that the mesh is actually changing just a little bit. In this case, it's not very extreme, but in some models it can be very extreme. And so if you were to um, uh, unwrap this, such as it is right now, you're since we have the subsurf modifier on, it's actually going to not perfectly translate the texture. And so your texture is actually going to be a little bit distorted than it actually should be. Well, now we have a new tool that when we hit U and unwrap, we now have a new option in here. And oops, let me Alt P to clear those seams. Okay, now I'll hit uh, U and unwrap. And you can see for one, I've got an error that says object scale is not one to one. So we want to be sure that we fix that. So if we undo that, go into object mode, hit control A and apply the scale. Uh, actually, I actually had some a couple of people that were having problems with this the other day. So even though this isn't new in 2.62, I want to go ahead and show it. Um, now, if I hit U and unwrap, I no longer get that error and I get a more accurate UV. So all's fine and dandy, but it's still not using the subsurf data. The subsurf data is now an option. If we bring up our toolbar and search in the, um, the operator panel, we can see we now have an option to use subsurf data. If I zoom in on the UVs here, so you can see it, if I click this, you'll see that the UVs shift just a little bit. And it takes just a little while. And you can see in this case, you know, the UVs have distorted a little bit, so I might need to do a little bit of pinning or fix things or whatnot to get them to work correctly, but that's all right. Um, you know, that's not the subject for today. And you can also specify a UV uh, subsurf level. So if I set this to level two, it's going to use that as the, uh, the method by which to designate the model or to see how to distort it. And obviously you can see that this is taking just a little while longer. So generally you're not going to want to go much higher than, than one if you don't need to. And of course this depends on the complexity of your model as well. Moving on, the uh, that's all the UV tools. The next thing that I want to show you is some of this stuff with cycles. There's a lot of additions to to cycles, m mostly mostly small changes, but then a couple of big things. The two big things, number one, is multi GPU rendering, where if you have multiple video cards in your machine, it'll allow you to use mul both of those. And of course, with GPU rendering, it only works with uh, CUDA enabled cards, so Nvidia cards only at the moment. And it also uh, requires shader model 1.3 or up. So older cards will not necessarily work unless you compile it yourself uh, specifically for those cards. Uh, you, if you search through the wikis, you can find a list of the supported cards. I know that unfortunately a lot of you will be disappointed to find that your card is not supported. Uh, in fact, mine are not supported either. Uh, but that's just the nature of it. And my understanding, the reason being, is that... Uh, a lot of the older cards, the ones that are not supported, actually don't show much speed up with the GPU rendering than with CPU, and in some cases are actually slower. And with anything, there's a point where you just need to start phasing out the older hardware. So in cycles though, with multi-GPU rendering, for one, we can now add, uh, set the compute device. So if you go in here, go to Blender, your user preferences, Underneath the system panel, you'll find a new option down here for compute device. And by default, it's set to none, which allows you to just set the CPU. But then you have CUDA or OpenCL. Keep in mind that OpenCL is still uh, very, very limited. It only supports clay rendering and in, you know, it's really only for testing at the moment. But under CUDA, you can then see we have our options here. So I have two video cards in this machine. And so it allows me to use both of them. And actually, neither of these support the shader model 1.3. Or, or else I just have not had any luck getting my drivers updated or something. But at the moment, it's not supported. Uh, and then I can, you know, if I want to just specify one card or the other, I can do that. If I want to switch it to open, OpenCL, I can do that. But let's just assume for a second that these cards actually do support Shader Model 1.3 and that I could use them. You would think that, well, if I set this now, that Cycles is just going to use um, GPU rendering. Well, that's not actually true. You first need to um, set your compute device switch over to the cycles render and then underneath your feature set right here 
you need to set this the device to GPU compute and if sometimes you may need to set it to experimental feature set or supported depending on uh, your system but if you set that to GPU compute then and switch into rendered mode you should go ahead and see it start rendering unless of course your CUDA device is not supported and you can see compute, compute capability 1.3 or up and I have 1.1 1 .1. Uh, but if you had, if I had 1.3, then it would immediately start rendering and all would be fine and dandy. Uh, so that's the compute device. So that's not really a huge feature, but it's a very nice usability feature. And just, you know, I know that a lot of you want to do uh, GPU rendering, so that's how you do it. The really big feature that is uh, very exciting with Cycles is we now have render layers and passes. Those of you that use the compositor will know how important this is. Um, by having the render layers and passes, we have the ability to break down the image into all of the different components that actually make up our render, such that then we can go in and fine tune them in the node-based compositor very easily. Um, render layers can be very confusing to a lot of people, particularly passes, because then you know you break down your image and you're not sure how to put it back together. Uh, well, there's this very handy graphic right here that shows exactly what the passes are in cycles and how they get mixed together. You can see that each one of these boxes is a different pass that's available and the, the graphic basically means that in order to get back to our combined render or the final image and to make it look exact we need to first add the diffuse and the, the diffuse direct and indirect multiply by the diffuse color and then mix and then do that for each one of these and then again add them together for each one. So I have, I have an example here. So if I just open up my barrels scene, some of you may re recognize this scene from uh, my tutorial that I did on it a while back. I did, it, did the complete tutorial on making this scene and rendering it in cycles. And just for to save time today, I'm not going to actually render this. So I've set it up with an EXR file so it supports all the layers. But first of all, underneath the render settings, you can see that we now have we have the layers just like in the Blender internal, and we now have all of our different passes where you can enable the combined Z, normal, object index, material index, etc., and then and then each of the passes for the diffuse, glossy, and transmission. So, looking at this in the compositor, and again, noticing that this is a EXR file that supports all the layers that I've saved out and then loaded back in so I don't have to re-render on the fly, we can see all of our passes. And if we look at this, uh, if we look at our background or our background here, we can see here is my combined pass viewing out of here. Then we've got the alpha pass, the Z pass, the normal pass, the emit, environment, diffuse direct, indirect, diffuse color, etc., etc., etc. So these are all of our different passes that we have available. And again, basing on that graphic for what we have, first of all, and let's double check the graphic. We have the diffuse direct plus indirect. So we add those together and then multiply times the diffuse color. So we can see this one here is adding the diffuse direct and indirect. And then it's multiplying right here times the diffuse color. And that then gives us this. And then we do that for the glossy and the transmission as well. This time I don't need to do the transmission because I don't actually have any transmissive materials in the, the scene. So I actually only need to do the glossy and the diffuse, but that's okay. But then once we add it all together, we come back and we get our final image right here. Now you will see that we have some fireflies in here and this is either due to me not rendering it long enough or there, it may be a bug, but you can see that the combined render does not have that. The, the node render does. Um, this could also be something that I'm doing wrong, but regardless, we have re render passes and layers now in cycles. A lot of you are going to be really excited to see this. I know that I am, um, and it really makes it really nice to be able to go in and fine tune, uh, fine tune a render after the fact without having to constantly re-render. Uh, you can definitely expect a full tutorial on using these in the very near future on Blender, Co Blender Cookie. So next, uh, we have one, one other small addition to cycles that's fairly significant, and that is the environment sampling. So environment map sampling, if you're having to use an HDRI map or something like that, we now have an option to sample as lamp in the world properties, and this just helps allocate more um, samples or CPU power basically to where the light's coming from in the environment such that we tend, we, it can help get a less noisy render. Um, the way this is done, if you just simply go over to your world buttons, if you happen to have a environment texture loaded in, 
under the settings, we now have a sample as lamp option and the ability to set that apologies for the overlay there. Um, but we can then set the resolution, which I don't, uh, it's the importance map size resolution. So this does not refer to the actual HDRI, I don't believe, but you can see the higher values could potentially produce less noise at the cost of memory and speed. So you can adjust that as needed. Uh, that's pretty much it for cycles. We've got a few other small things such as BVH caching, which is really nice if you're doing an animation. Um, you know that the, the BVH has to build up at each time, every time you start a new render. Uh, but for if you're doing an animation and your meshes are staying in place or the meshes are not changing, then you don't want to have to rebuild these each time. And so it'll actually cache that and then simply adjust the, you know, do everything else that it needs to do without rebuilding the BVH cache at each time. You can find this underneath the render properties and under performance cache BVH. So this is really only used if, um, if you're doing an animation, uh, if we're doing a, in, a single frame render, it doesn't actually have any effect that I know of. Uh, next, in cycles, we also now, for the nodes, we also have several new nodes that we can use, and those are the, uh, the normal and gamma. So we've got the normal here, and then we should have a gamma somewhere in here, and then we also have a checker pattern. So if you go to, it would be, I believe, under color, or it's somewhere in here. Oh, input and texture, I believe. Well, somewhere in here, we have a, a checker node now uh, that we can then use to quickly generate a, basically a, uh, think of it like a checkerboard, essentially, uh, and works really quickly and very well. Uh, not sure where it's at in here, somewhere in here, but enough of that. Um, next, so that's pretty much it for cycles. You can see, you know, here's keep reading on, on all the other stuff in there. Oh, one other thing is that border rendering is now supported. So if you go in to your 3D view and hit, um, uh, I believe it's shift B. Yeah. Shift B, you can then drag out across a border and then only that section will then be rendered. All right, moving on, let's load up a new file and look at the remesh modifier. So the remesh modifier is very, very cool and it kind of serves two purposes. But let's look at a basic example first. So I'm just going to delete the cube and add in a Suzanne. The remesh modifier allows us to basically rebuild the geometry of a model in a couple of different ways. So if we go to the modifiers, add modifier and choose remesh right here, you can see, well, with by default with Suzanne, it, it looks pretty awful. Um, but we have several different modes. We have sharp, smooth, and blocks. Smooth then is what you're going to use most of the time. And it basically regenerates a quad, a quad only mesh based on the, the volume of sorts. So if we now increase the octree depth, which the octree depth is basically the resolution. So the higher the value and it goes all the way up to six, um, the, or maybe it goes to, I believe it goes to nine, actually, uh, the higher the, the depth, the higher or the higher quality your model will be. So if we move that all the way up to nine, it may take just a moment and you can see that it's gotten pretty high resolution. So we really don't need to go nearly that high. Uh, so let's just try, we'll do six for the time being. So you can see it's quad only. We have the option to adjust the scale and the scale is strictly for fine tuning. So you can see as I decrease this, it still keeps the resolution the same, but it's kind of scaling it up. And so basically set the octree depth to about where you need it and then use the scale and it goes up to 0.99 to then fine tune and adjust. Uh, next, we have the option to remove disconnected pieces. Uh, this case, you can see that it, with that option, it removes the shape of the eyes because it's a disconnected mesh. Uh, and we have a threshold for that disconnect option. Uh, next, we have the, so we've already seen the sharp, and then we've got the blocks. The blocks is mostly just kind of for fun. It just basically fills it with blocks doesn't really serve a real purpose except for maybe some kind of fun um, uh, graphical stuff. So I'm sure that a lot of people will actually use this uh, for fun, but it doesn't necessarily serve a practical purpose. Speaking of practical purposes, let's look at um, the remesh modifier, two practical purposes of the remesh modifier. The first is for sculpting. For sculpting, if we set, the, well, actually, let's do this with a new model. I'm going to just add in a cube. On this cube, I'm going to add in a multi-resolution modifier, 
and we're just going to subdivide this a few times and switch over to sculpt mode and say grab the grab brush and we'll maybe just kind of pull this up a bit and keep going keep going all right so I have I start to get this kind of shark fin effect but you'll notice that as I've been doing this I've been stretching these polygons all through here which doesn't really work very well because now I don't have nearly the resolution in these areas as I do in these areas and this is something that unlimited clay a feature that many of you will be familiar with that's been in development for a while that may or may not get added but regardless of a cool feature, it automatically regenerates the topology as you go around here is very cool. And, and Remesh kind of solves that problem. It's just not on the fly. So the practical example of Remesh then is to go ahead and apply this multi-res modifier to basically rebuild our mesh before we continue sculpting. So we apply the multi-res, then we go in and add in a Remesh, set it to smooth, and then maybe increase the octree depth, you know, a little bit to about there. We don't want to make it too dense. And then we can fine tune the scale just a little bit to adjust it a bit. We don't need disconnect, re remove disconnected pieces because we don't have any in there. And then we could go ahead and apply that and then start sculpting on this again to have a nice evenly distributed mesh that then is quad, it's quad only. So it'll sculpt very nicely and we've got even geometry so that even if I want to add detail in here, I can just as well as I can down here. And so you could even do this a couple times throughout your model if you really wanted to, but it's really good for starting with a very simple mesh, quickly stretch out the shape that you want without worrying about um, disrupting the geometry and then rebuild it with the remesh modifier. Very cool. The other thing that remesh is good for is to uh, make making usable text objects. So if you're you may be aware that when we work with text in blender if we add in say some extruded depth to this say something like this and if we wanted to then go in and modify the model that maybe we want to create an inset around here or something like that we would need to first press alt C to convert it to a mesh from a curve or text. If we do that you'll know that we just get absolutely horrendous geometry. Um, you know, the T and the X really are not too bad, and we can very easily go in and fix some of those. All you notice is we've got a lot of duplicate vertices. But with more complicated letters, and like if you look at the E, it's just, it's just awful. You know, it, while yes, we could work with it, it's not very fun to work with. So with the remesh modifier, we can go in, add a remesh, and this is the case where you would use the, the sharp mode. And for one with text, be sure to remove disconnected, not remove disconnected pieces, enable the sharp mode, and then increase the octree depth. And if we look at this now, if we were to apply this, you notice that we have a very nice, clean, quad-only geometry that can very easily be worked with, no problem. So great example of the re remesh modifier, particularly here, you can see on the T, you know, it's very nice and clean. And of course, you know, we could go in and if we wanted to remove a few of these edge loops, we could. But that's the key is you notice that they're actual edge loops, they're all connected, it's quad-only, very easy to work with. So good example of using the remesh modifier uh, for, for text. Next thing in 2.62 is we have new Boolean systems. Um, the Boolean, not really a new Boolean system, but a new library behind it. And it's called the Carve Library. And it doesn't change anything on the surface for most of us users, except for the fact that Booleans are now much faster and in general provide much better results. So for example, if we go in and say, add in, say, a cube on this cube, I'm going to go ahead and subdivide it a couple of times just so it's a little bit more complex. And then I'm going to add in a UV sphere. And we'll just take it, say, something like that. If I now add in a Boolean modifier to this and set it to the sphere, and then let's just set it to, let's just say, difference, and then we'll hide the sphere, you can see that it works great. Uh, if we look at the actual mesh, it looks pretty good. Uh, with two point, well, it looks pretty good, but the main thing to note is how fast it is. You notice, you may some of you may remember that in 2.61 and back, if we were to work with a a boolean system uh, and let me just set this to wireframe mode so you can see this more clearly if we set this to wire you can see it working you may know that you know doing something like this with the old system was just incredibly slow and one of the bad things about using booleans was not only because of bad geometry but was how incredibly slow they worked where now it works very nice and quick we could then go in and apply this modifier delete our sphere and there's our geometry. Now, you know, this is not 
necessarily a case to always use booleans for all kinds of things because you still get this nasty geometry around the edges that we would need to clean up but they're much faster and much more usable now so very very cool and with the next version 2.63 uh, coming out with BMesh included, we should see even better Booleans. So finally, we may have usable Booleans in Blender. Uh, moving on, we've got a lot of uh, new Game Engine additions. So if we look at the Game Engine, there's a lot of little things. I'm not going to specifically cover all of these because I'm not familiar enough with the Game Engine. But uh, if you just read through this list, things like uh, some of the, the user interface has been reorganized to have a standalone player and embed player separate sections. So if we go over here to Blender Game, switch over to Render Properties, we now have a section for embedded player and standalone player. We can adjust the resolution independently of each other. Um, we've got the ability for multi-sampling in the Blender player for full screen option. We can set the option for the Blender player desktop resolution. Um, we can now, uh, the Blender player can now actually be launched from within Blender. You know, lots of little things like that. Text objects now work a lot better for, with properties for text. So for changing text dynamically in, a, in the game via a property now actually works. Um, Camera actuator, Python, a lot of different little things just throughout the game engine that are, you know, great little improvements. Um, and the one main one is copy all physics attributes uh, is now actually a tool in the object and game menu. So if you go to object and it should be, uh, should be in here somewhere. Uh, let's see, it was an object game. There we go. And in game, we can now copy all the physics or the logic bricks or any of the others. Uh, makes it really easy to then, uh, you know, add, say, physics to one object and then quickly copy it over to a bunch of other objects. And then one other little thing is that we now have an actual escape key. So if you, you know, if you go into the game engine and want to leave it, generally it's just escape. But if you wanted to customize that exit key, you could do so right there. So that's some of the game engine stuff. Um, one other really big feature that's been added to Blender is motion tracking. Uh, many of you will be familiar that 2.61 included camera tracking, which is just incredibly cool, allows you to uh, basically track all the data from a actual camera. So if you take a video file, you can input it and then recreate that camera motion in 3D for then integrating 3D elements in the actual footage and compositing. Well, it now supports object tracking as well. So for example, you can see here they're using basically um, some widgets kind of attached to an arm that then we can track these and actually relate those then to an actual object. So you could then replace the hand, you know, with a plasma cannon or whatever else you wanted to replace it with. Um, there's some great examples online on how to do this already. Um, personally, I haven't used it yet, and so I'm not even going to pretend to uh, seem like I know what I'm talking about. And I encourage you to go ahead and just check out some of the examples, read up on it, and uh, play around with it. If you've ever used the camera tracker, then you already have a head start and know how to use it for the most part. So that's those are the main things. Um, and then lastly, a couple awesome, awesome usability features that many of you actually may have followed on the Blender Artist thread, but we now have full drag and drop parenting in the Outliner. So the Outliner is an incredibly cool tool that has been a bit limited in the past, but is, is getting better and better. So for example, if I wanted to parent the camera to the cube such that the camera would always follow the cube, generally I would select the camera, I would select the object, and then I would press Control P to set the parent. Well, now I can simply select the camera in the outliner, drag and drop it onto the cube. You can see drop to set parent. It'll automatically set that parent. We can then set the cube to the lamp, and then all of them will follow the lamp. Uh, if we want to unparent it, we simply drag it out of the lamp, and it will unparent. Um, we can also do advanced parents in here. So, for example, if I go in and add in, say, an armature with a single bone, and I now drag my cube on top of the armature, I then get the option to set the parent based on the armature. Since armatures support like automatic weights and things like that, it all just works. And now my rig is working. Of course, that didn't really work very well with this model, but case in point, it works. Um, so that's pretty much it for the outliner. Very, very cool, works great. Um, you know, for everything from clearing parents to assigning parents to advanced parents, very nice little usability feature that makes it very easy to set those parents without having to remember hotkeys, without having to remember menu locations or going into object properties or anything like that. 
Very, very cool. Works great. Uh, so that is Blender 2.62. Highly encourage, if you haven't already, if you're using an older version, if you're using you know 2.57, 2.54, or 2.49 even, highly, highly encourage you to go and grab it. Uh, it's wonderful. It continues just getting better and better and better. Um, we've now got better Colada's support for Second Life, additional features, a few add-on things, changes, and tons and tons of bug fixes. In fact, 205 bugs were fixed if you're not using 2.62, you should be. Go get it and enjoy.